it is certainly an interesting time for Airbnb right here in Asia, especially when you look at what has happened to some of its Western tech contemporaries. Uber is long gone. A much rumored Zillow expansion into Asia has never materialized for various reasons. And of course, we were never quite managed to reach the heights it found elsewhere in the world because of competition from both regional and local players who did co-working better than it could. Meanwhile, Airbnb continues to chug along in Asia, operating in what is pretty much a legal gray area that doesn't seem all of that sustainable in the long term. Does this mean Airbnb is doomed in Asia? It's a good question, and today on Interesting Asia, we'll be answering it. It has not been smooth sailing for Airbnb in Asia, to say the least, the short-term rental operator. Well, it really began scaling up operations between, I'd say, 2016 and 2018 as it looked to replicate the success it found elsewhere in the world, most notably North America and Europe. However, in Asia, it found confusing regulations that varied significantly from country to country to country. Then there were the local populations who seemed more than okay with actually using the platform, but were far less enthralled with the reality of randos staying in the residential developments they call home. During those early years, Airbnb delicately danced between lobbying governments to avoid outright bans, growing the number of hosts in an uncertain environment, and not pissing off locals. Sometimes it worked. In many other cases, it did not. In 2018, there was a massive Airbnb crackdown in Japan that saw approximately 80% of the platform's listing removed. Elsewhere during this time, Singapore, South Korea, and Thailand were among the countries to keep rules in place that effectively made Airbnb illegal in those respective territories without this necessarily being an outright ban on the platform. Guests and property owners continued to use Airbnb, although the situation was less than ideal. Things continued in this gray area up until 2020 with little progress made on clarifying Airbnb's operational status. Then of course, the pandemic hit and it stopped tourism dead in its tracks. With no one using Airbnb, these issues vanished. That has changed recently though. Tourism across Asia has gradually ramped up over the past 18 to 24 months, and now we're seeing some countries reporting tourism arrival figures being close to or having even surpassed pre-pandemic levels. This has placed Airbnb firmly in the crosshairs once again. In May, the island of Penang in Malaysia became the first destination in Southeast Asia to outright ban short-term rentals. The rules put in place state private residential properties can no longer be used for short-term rentals on the island of Penang unless 75% of unit owners approve the building to be operated on a commercial basis. Why did the island of Penang feel compelled to take such a drastic action against Airbnb? Well, honestly, it's guests behaving badly. Noise complaints, unruly behavior, and other things like that. This of course is nothing new for Airbnb, in fact it continues to be a blight on the platform and the company seems really just unable to curb the bad behavior. This is a case of a few bad apples spoiling the bunch. In reality, most Airbnb users are fine. Fine though, it doesn't work in Asia. That is especially true in condominiums where space is very limited. Most residents do not want strangers making noise and using facilities regardless of whether they are on their best behavior or not. For folks in many countries, seeing a steady stream of strangers showing up in the apartment down the hall, it just doesn't work for them. And that's just how it is. Now, business challenges are really compounding these issues for Airbnb in Asia. The company has already shut down its domestic business in China, with the platform now only supporting outbound travelers. 
Ultimately, Airbnb could not fend off challenges from domestic companies offering short-term rental bookings. Additionally, a spate of local players across Asia focused solely on their home markets is really giving Airbnb a run for its money. In Japan, space market has gone from startup to IPO over the past five years thanks to a platform and offerings better suited to the Japanese market. Indonesia's Travilio appears to have sidestepped many of the issues plaguing Airbnb by working directly with home builders who better understand local real estate regulations in the country. This has sometimes involved reserving entire floors or sections of a condominium building to be used specifically as short-term rentals. These units are then sold exclusively to investors who plan on renting out their properties. There were also a few developers in Southeast Asia and countries such as the Philippines and Thailand who have taken it upon themselves to also pursue this technique while still using Airbnb as a vehicle to market their available units. This solution, while better for residents, also doesn't require Airbnb at all. Asia-focused competitors such as Agoda have really aggressively targeted this segment focused on overseas guests and I think Agoda in particular has had some success in that regard compared to Airbnb. One of the biggest challenges Airbnb faces when it comes to survival in Asia is branding, plain and simple. The company loves using these flowery terms, host, stays, experiences, when in reality, in all honestly here, it is an operation that books unlicensed hotel rooms in private residential buildings. That, quite frankly, is far less romantic and also extremely problematic for both property owners and its guests. It goes without saying that is far less romantic and it's also far more problematic for both the property owners listing on the platform as well as users renting properties using Airbnb. This has reared its ugly head on several occasions. In Ipo, Malaysia, a condo building began refusing entry to anyone staying there with an Airbnb reservation. More and more condominium developments in Bangkok now have large signs in the lobbies clearly stating that using Airbnb in Thailand is illegal and that those guests can be removed by building management. That goes back to the reality most Asian countries do have rules in place that prevent short-term rentals of any kind. Additionally, most residential buildings reserve the right to simply outright ban the service or the practice of short-term rentals if it so chooses. Normally, this has been put up by, for a vote by the various juristic uh, division of the building, the juristic board that obviously represents the tenants. Many of them have held votes years ago in the past on whether or not those buildings were going to accept short-term rentals. They almost exclusively do not because most of the people that vote in juristic meetings are actual residents. So yeah, a lot of people think when they buy a condominium unit that they have the right to do whatever they want with it. In reality, they have signed an agreement what states they will not use it for short-term rentals. If we are being honest here though, these agreements have rarely been enforced historically. It's just a lot of work. It's a lot of, it's just a lot of headaches. Many building management companies don't want to deal with. However, the threat, it is very real and it remains. More importantly, this impacts Airbnb's core Asia business and core business in general of an individual renting out a single unit in a high density residential development. That of course is where the bad guest problems stem from. Previously there hadn't really been any appetite to restrict or limit Airbnb operations in most Asian countries apart from maybe Japan. However, with Penang's recent move against Airbnb, in addition to a number of major cities across the globe putting measures in place to restrict the service, more regional destinations may be willing to take action and fight this fight. Even if that's not the case, and this isn't a government-driven initiative, building management companies are well within their right to restrict or limit or ban guests using Airbnb in their buildings.
hell, they may even feel more empowered to actually take action, seeing sort of the tide now shift against short-term rentals and complaints getting louder and louder and louder from residents who simply don't want short-term renters in their buildings. Will Airbnb survive in Asia? Before we can successfully answer that question, we must first answer the question of what value does Airbnb provide? And right now, in Asia, that's not a hell of a lot. The company loves championing the fact it can assist countries dealing with hotel room shortages caused by staffing issues. That is a misrepresentation of reality if there ever was one. Airbnb is simply passing the buck here. At best, they're a middleman. I think when you look at Asia in particular, you know, most guests are never going to meet their host to begin with. In some cases, the person listing the property will merely give the key to building management who they ask to pass on to the person making a reservation. Usually, this is all done under the guise that the individual is a friend of the unit owner leaving the key behind. Other times, the keys will just be left in the mailbox for the guests to pick up on their own. In fact, this is something I experienced at my Bangkok condominium a few weeks ago when someone using Airbnb was told that their key and their key card was in a mailbox. But you can't actually get to the mailbox without a key card in the first place. Now, I just let them in not wanting to have to explain all of this to them but it's easy to see why residents would not be thrilled with people wandering around their building trying to find mailboxes to access key cards and keys and whatnot it is safe to say these are not enriching cultural experiences residential buildings in asia unable to support an influx of short-term renters that it was never prepared for are now being forced to sort through issues they didn't cause in the first place Sure, a single unit owner and obviously Airbnb are profiting from this service. They also don't have to deal with the aftermath of their actions or the general inconveniences caused. That falls on the tens if not hundreds of residents of that building as well as building management staff. It is safe to say in this scenario, Airbnb is not providing much of anything apart from money for itself and that one unit owner. Without radically changing its core business, Airbnb looks to be doomed in Asia. Local players are far better suited to work in their respective markets and as we have seen in some cases, they are already working with developers to find solutions that actually don't take away from the residential experience. On the other hand, all Airbnb has done is trudged along the same path while telling everyone who will lessen about the value it provides or offering ominous warnings about what will happen to tourism should it be banned. Look, Airbnb could survive in Asia if, instead of talking, it actually focused on creating a better business strategy that was suited for the markets here. History shows us though that is unlikely to happen. The probable fate of Airbnb is that it goes the way of Uber and eventually retreats from Asia, probably after losing money in the process. So is Airbnb doomed in Asia? Yes, although that doesn't have to be the case. That does it for me. I am Cheyenne Hollis. This is Interesting Asia and make sure you hashtag keep it interesting.